I'm back. Still trying to get a decent thumbnail. <laughs> okay, we're at chapter 12. If you hear a little, it's my heater. Cold, cold, cold. Chapter 12, Dan's Christmas. Where was Dan? In prison. Alas for Mrs. Joe, how her heart would have ached if she had known that while old Plum shone with Christmas cheer, her boy sat alone in his cell, trying to read the little book she gave him, with eyes dimmed now and then by the hot tears. No physical suffering had ever wrung from him, and longing with a homesick heart for all that he had lost. Yes, Dan was in prison. But no cry for help from him as he faced the terrible strait. He was in with the dumb despair of an Indian at the stake for his own bosom sin had brought him there, and this was to be the bitter lesson that tamed the lawless spirit and taught him self-control. Yikes. The story of his downfall is soon told, for it came, as so often happens, just when he felt unusually full of high hopes, good resolutions, and dreams of a better life. On his journey, he met a pleasant young fellow and naturally felt an interest in him, as Blair... B-L-A-I-R, was on his way to join his elder brothers on a ranch in Kansas. Card playing was going on in the smoking car, and the lad, for he was barely 20, tired with a long journey, beguiled the way with such partners as appeared being full of spirits and a little intoxicated with the freedom of the West. Dan, true to his promise, would not join, but watched with intense interest the games that went on, and soon made up his mind that two of the men were sharpers anxious to fleece the boy who had impudently displayed a well-filled pocketbook. Dan always had a soft spot in his heart for any younger, weaker creature whom he met, and something about the lad reminded him of Teddy. So he kept an eye on Blair and warned him against his new friends. Vainly, of course, for when all stopped overnight in one of the great cities, Dan missed the boy from the hotel whither he had taken him for safekeeping and learning who had come for him went to find him, calling himself a fool for his pains and yet unable to leave the confiding boy to the dangers that surrounded him. He found him gambling in a low place with the men who were bound to have his money, and by the look of relief on Blair's anxious face when he saw him, Dan knew without words that things were going badly with him, and he saw the peril too late. I can't come yet. I've lost. It's not my money. I must get it back, or I dare not face my brothers, whispered the poor lad when Dan begged him to get away without further loss. Shame and fear made him desperate, and he played on, sure that he could recover the money confided to his care. Seeing Dan's resolute face, keen eye, and traveled air, the sharpers were wary, played fair, and let the boy win a little. But they had no mind to give up their prey, and finding that Dan stood sentinel, uh, sentinel at the boy's back, an ominous glance was exchanged between them, which meant, which meant, we must get this fellow out of the way. Dan saw it and was on his guard, for he and Blair were strangers. Evil deeds are easily done in such places and no tales told, but he would not desert the boy and still kept watch of every card till he plainly detected a false play and boldly said so. High words passed. Dan's indignation overcame his prudence, and when the cheat refused to restore his plunder with insulting words and drawn pistol, Dan's hot temper flashed out, and he knocked the man down with a blow that sent him crashing head first against a, against a stove to roll senseless and bleeding to the floor. A wild scene followed, 
But in the midst of it, Dan whispered to the boy, Get away and hold your tongue. Don't mind me. Frightened and bewildered, Blair quitted the city at once, leaving Dan to pass the night in the lockup. And a few days later, to stand in court, charged with manslaughter, for the man was dead. Dan had no friends, and having once briefly told the story, held his peace, anxious to keep all knowledge of this sad affair from those at home. He even concealed his name, giving that of David Kent, as he had done several times before in emergencies. It was all over very soon, but as there was extenuating circumstances, his sentence was a year in prison with hard labor. Dazed by the rapidity with which this horrible change in his life came upon him, <coughs> Dan did not fully realize it till the iron door clanged behind him and he sat alone in a cell as narrow, cold, and silent as a tomb. He knew that a word would bring Mr. Lorry to help and comfort him, but he could not bear to tell of this disgrace or see the, the sorrow and the shame it would cause the friends who hoped so much for him. No, he said, clenching his fist, I'll let them think me dead first. I shall be if I'm kept here long, and he sprang up to pace the stone floor like a caged lion with a turmoil of wrath and grief, rebellion, and remorse, seething in heart and brain, till he felt as if he should go mad and beat upon the walls that shut him away from the liberty which was his life. For days he suffered terribly, that worn out, then worn out, sank into a black melancholy, sadder to see than his excitement. The warden of this prison was a rough man who had won the ill will of all by unnecessary harshness. But the chaplain was full of sympathy and did his hard duty faithfully and tenderly. He labored with poor Dan but seemed to make no impression and was forced to wait till work had soothed the excited nerves and captively tamed the proud spirit that would suffer but not complain. Dan was put in the brush shop, and feeling that activity was his only salvation, worked with feverish energy that soon won the approval of the master and the envy of less skillful mates. Day after day, he sat in his place, watched by an armed overseer, forbidden any but necessary words, no intercourse with the men beside him, no change but from cell to shop. No exercise, but the dreary marches to and fro, each man's hand on the other's shoulder, keeping step with the dreary tramp, so different from the ringing tread of soldiers' silent gaunt. gaunt. Sorry, my page went away saying I was running out of storage. If I can get back. Oh, gone it. I was getting into it. <laughs> Please take me back to where I was. 